Welcome everybody to today's session. We are going to be talking about implementing QuickBooks Online with a client. I am super excited to be with you guys. And um, in case you're wondering who this is, my name is Carla Caldwell. I do bookkeeping and accounting for not-for-profits as well as for growing small businesses. I'm in the Atlanta area and I also work with um, accounting firms some really small ones up to some really, really large ones. Um, and I strategically guide accounting teams to become a modern practice. And for me, it's super exciting to do this because I know what it's like when we have frustrations at work and we're trying to do new and different things and want to really grow our practices. So for me, this is just super exciting to get to be with you guys today as we look at implementing QuickBooks Online with our clients. And I think it's really important to be able to do this because um, one of the things that I have found is, you know, implementing a new system for a client really is sometimes a big disruption in their business. And so how can we make that as smooth as possible? And because we know it might be a disruption, we kind of get stressed a bit as an accountant and uh, or accounting professional, bookkeepers or accountants. And so, um, how do we make that process a bit better? So we're going to talk about that. And so we see some questions are coming in. If you're not familiar with the GoToWebinar control panel, we do uh, invite you guys to ask some questions in there. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and just to answer one question that just came in, yes, Jeffrey, I do have a church as a client um, and other nonprofits that are um, parachurch ministries, if you will, as well as um, other types as well. So work with all different types. Um, so our agenda for today, we are going to talk about selecting the right QuickBooks online subscription for your client, which is important. Uh, we're going to talk about creating a new QBO company. Um, we're going to talk about converting it over from QuickBooks desktop, how you complete the best, uh, the setup, and then talk about best practices, which is probably my favorite part of the entire topic because really understanding how to have those conversations with your clients about this is really important to set this up for a successful conversion. Um, as we talked about it yesterday and other times throughout this, um, set, this series of sessions, you're gonna see that we really want you to be informed of other resources that are going to help you in your pursuit of that new firm or that changed firm or whatever uh, efficient firm, healthy firm, successful firm, profitable firm, right? We all want those things. So Intuit has provided a website for, called qbtrainingevents.com, which is where you can go and access various training that is available to you as an accounting professional. And you're gonna see that they have not only these types of introductory courses, but you're gonna have certification courses, advanced certification courses, as well as uh, other types of um, education that is available to you that might be helpful as you grow your practice or get deeper into some of the techie sides of, of QuickBooks or perhaps you focus more on the on the growth side but all of that is going to be there. The QBO blog is extremely important for you to know about as new features are added into QuickBooks Online for you to know what's coming up that's kind of helpful and one of my favorites is firmofthefuture.com because that is a site that is going to be really relevant for you and perhaps um, some of the people on your team, as they are getting into this um, environment, perhaps for the first time, and so those types of things are going to be discussed there, along with other ways to grow your practice, new things going on with Intuit and the ProAdvisor community, and just great, great resources and information available for you. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. So CPE is going to be available for those of you that want to get that. It's continuing professional education for the CPAs on the call, but it is of course um, going to be emailed to you as you have seen before we've talked about. Just make sure that you participate in the polling questions, but that's for everybody, not just for those looking for CPE, because it makes it much more fun than just being um, me talking the whole time and you not interacting. I mentioned that you are able to ask questions and I saw some were coming in already. So what you can do is in the GoTo control panel webinar on the right side of your screen, you are able to ask questions and we are really fortunate to have Woody Adams on the call today answering some questions for us. Um, 
The only thing we ask is that those questions are related to the content we're talking about in class today. If you need support on a very specific issue with a client, please contact support directly because they're going to be better able to handle that question for you and you know dive into the details of what needs to happen there. Um, there is a test drive that you can access to play around with QuickBooks Online, and I highly, highly recommend that. I would encourage you to get to know that sample data so that you can use that when you're demoing the product to a client or just tinkering around trying to see how things work. That could be a really helpful tool for you. Today, you're also going to have access to the handouts, and you're going to find that also in the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side under the handouts section. You can download today's slides as well as an assessment worksheet, which I think is extremely helpful for you. That worksheet is actually in the form of an Excel file because you're going to see that we use this as we're onboarding new clients. So you can check that out as well. Um, and then there's some other things there for you. So definitely get those handout, handouts and download those so that you have access to those after the training. So let's go ahead and ask our very first polling question. Um, and we're going to ask you what your primary reason for attending today's session is. And so if you would just answer that, remember there's no right or wrong. There is no uh, grade on this. This is really recording whether or not you guys are awake and listening um, throughout the webinar. And of course, it just makes it much more fun for us to chat um, and all of that. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, go ahead and answer that. And I am going to close down the poll so we can get on into the meat of the content that we're trying to talk about today. And so I'm going to close it down in three, two, and one. And the vast majority of you are here to learn all about QBO, which is awesome because that's what I'm here to tell you about. So that's what we're going to do. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how to select the right subscription for your client. And so this session is going to talk about all these wonderful things here but we're gonna dive right in. The first thing that we wanna do is go through a few tips about recommending QuickBooks Online. Because once you get to know the client a little bit, then you're gonna be able to know what subscription to offer to the client, right? You can look at the list of features for the product, but we need to know a little bit about what's going on in this client's world. So first thing we need to do is we, meet, we need to meet with them to discuss their current processes. What is it that they do? Now, if you guys are like me, you might sit down with the owner of the small business and they start telling you these things, but they're not the ones that are actually doing it. Maybe they're using QuickBooks Desktop, maybe they're using Excel spreadsheets, whatever it is. Who is it that's actually going to be doing the work? That is really important. We just sat down with a client recently and he told us about his processes and then we finally got to sit down with the person that was actually doing the work and it just totally transformed our conversation. And so you need to make sure you're talking with the people that are actually going to be doing the work in there. You need to make sure that you also are looking in that test drive company and that sample company to try out workflows before you recommend them. So recently I had the opportunity to speak to the head of an organization. They told me about some of their issues that they were having. I was able to speak to another person in the firm. So I really did get to talk to the people that were going to be doing the work and came up with some workflows inside the sample company that were amazing. This is just absolutely fantastic for their company. And we tested it out and I actually was able to run financial statements where they could see how it flowed through because me telling them and them seeing it makes all the difference, right? I can tell somebody it works, but when they see it, they know it works, right? So we were able to do all of that and we landed that client and several others as a result of that conversation. So really testing some stuff out and it doesn't take long. You just need to try out a few transactions here and there and just let them see it. So I encourage you to do that. And then you're able to help them understand why this subscription is the one that you recommend for them. And so that is really what you're wanting to do. The whole idea is going at it from a place of consulting and helping them run their business better. And that's the kind of conversation that we wanna have with them. So as we go through this process, the needs assessment is going to entail discussing really all different types of, of areas in their business. We need to know basic information about their company. 
what type of entity are they, as an example? Um, what is their administration or their IT made up of? Do they have an admin? Um, I have an organization that I work with and there's no administration uh, employed at that company. So we charge a little bit more because we know that lands on us a little bit, not, not a ton. I'm still not going to do filing and, and basic email replies and things like that for them. But sometimes there's a little extra stuff that I have to do sometimes for them. And, and we're willing to do that, but we have to get paid to do those things. And so we talk about that. Um, we go through sales, purchases, operations, HR and payroll can be a big part of what you might do with them um, and reporting. What is it that they need at the end of all of this that they want to see from the way for the way that they run their business? And so we have to help with that. And yes, of course, we still have some compliance things we have to deal with, but you'll notice that's last. That's not what we lead with. It's not typically. Now, the, again, that's not everybody, I realize, but for us, that is not where we lead. Um, it is just part of what we do as we work through the processes of assisting them and making sure they're on the right path. All right. So in this needs assessment, as we're talking about sales, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, um, we talk about if they're doing retail or e-commerce, and that's important because natively QuickBooks Online is not doing that. It's going to integrate with an app, which is fine, but there's some additional things that go on with that because of course anytime we're talking about selling anything we have to talk about sales tax and so those are some things that we have to be aware of um, they're going to be accepting credit cards what type of credit card system are they on what kind of reporting can we get from it and so on these are things that affect how we are going to work with that client do they automate their invoices or have sales receipts will they want progress invoicing do they use price levels all of these types of things are going to be discussed in their sales process. How do they determine their sales? How do they sell whatever they're doing and so on? On the expenses side, are they doing true accounts payable? Now, sometimes our clients say that they don't have accounts payable and that's because they hold the invoices until the last minute to pay them. And really what we need to do is have that in a true payable system so they can start projecting cash flow requirements. But Again, understanding that process is part of what we do. Um, do they write checks? That's a big question that I have for my clients because we don't do a ton of check writing. We automate that process or do online payments. And so we discuss those things with them. Um, expenses as in um, using credit cards and debit cards, things like that. Do they do job costing? So when they have an expense, is it allocated to a particular project? Do they need an approval process? And what kind of expense reporting do they have or do they? Maybe they issue corporate cards to people or do people pay for things personally and need to be reimbursed? We have to understand that so we can make sure we set up the right system for them. And of course, we need to talk about inventory. QuickBooks Online inventory works for a lot of clients and it's just perfectly fine. But some of our clients are needing to have a little bit more robust functionality in there which would mean that they might need to be looking at an app instead of using QBO natively. So those are considerations that we have to discuss. We need to understand their inventory a little bit. I work with a client that is using QBO's inventory and they're doing just fine. They're running on FIFO inventory. Um, they have one location. They don't do any scanning. They sort of assemble items. They kind of group them together. Um, and so they've made it work because they're a nonprofit. They don't necessarily need to be um, paying for another app. But if they were a for-profit and they were able to do some other things, they, they, they know that's one of the things that they want to get to is having a more robust inventory system. But for now, they're okay with where they are. And so there's some things like that that we have those conversations and plan for that. But they know what QBO can do and can't do for them as far as inventory is concerned. And so we have to explore that conversation a bit. On the payroll piece, of course, we're gonna talk about it today that of course Intuit has QuickBooks Online Payroll and, and they can do that there. Um, but how are they tracking time or are they? I have clients that are doing time tracking using T-Sheets or something else, some other online application. I have others that are doing Google Spreadsheets, right? So uh, it just depends on the client and what they're needing to do. Um, are they in multiple states? Do they have commissions? Do they have bonuses? Um, all those types of things. And do they need benefits? Um, are they 
doing okay with their workers' comp and the insurance policies and whatnot. And sometimes that's not an area your firm wants to get into, but you still got to pay the bill for it. You still have to make sure the client's having those amounts deducted from the paychecks and so on. So we talk about that, including the number of employees that they have. And so those are the types of things that we have to discuss in there as well. Um, a lot of these um, are going to be important conversations and it doesn't mean you tackle all of it up front. I have a client that I've been working with for well over a year and I've told him for a year that his payroll is not the way it needs to be um, as far as the, the company that's processing it for them. And so by the end of this year, they'll be converting over to QBO payroll. So we also need to be talking about KPIs and reporting. This is just kind of a special personal passion I have um, about doing reporting and financial analysis and things like that. I just enjoy that way more than I should. And so I always think about that at the beginning, right? When I start talking to a new client that's growing and has some needs of where they wanna be in their business and I start talking to them, I wanna know the kinds of reporting that they are looking for now because then I can plan for that. Over the next six months, we're gonna do X, Y, Z, but then right after that, we're gonna to need to be doing this, that, and the other. And so we talk about those things. Um, we look at measurements and things that they wanna track and how they know they're profitable on different things and so on. So we talk about that and really come alongside and help them and, and really partner with them. And so it is a very different conversation than your books are done. It's, this is what's going on in your business. These are things you need to be aware of and be looking for, and we have those conversations. And as I said, we do have to deal with uh, compliance and, and work through those things with our clients as well. So we deal with sales tax. Um, we have to be able to have systems in place that will track that, report on it, and calculate it and all of that. Of course, QuickBooks Online does that. Um, the more robust client that needs to be tracking sales tax in multiple states and has strange kind of items that could be taxable in some states and non-taxable in other states and things like that might start looking at something just like growing out of an inventory uh, system. It might need to get into something a little bit more robust, but thankfully there are apps that do all these types of things that I've been talking about so far. And also tax planning. Now, I personally don't do taxes in our firm. Our, we don't do that at all. But there are conversations and tax laws we still have to know about and work with our clients on, like meals versus entertainment versus staff meetings versus whatever and how those are so we classify those appropriately so that our clients are able to um, provide that information to their accountant at the end of the year. So all of these types of things we need to discuss with our clients. And so one of the things that we've provided to you as part of this session is an assessment worksheet that should be a starting point for you of the types of questions you might be discussing with clients so you can get to know them well and make sure they're a fit for the types of services you provide. If a client contacts me and says, I really want a firm that is going to handle my day-to-day -day accounting, does my tax planning and my tax preparation at the end of the year, I'm not a good fit for them. But if they want to have somebody who's going to partner with them on a month-to-month -month basis and help them out, making sure their financials are understandable, they can run their business well, and they have somebody that works with them on their workflow and processes and coordinates with their accountant, then our firm's a great fit. And so that is really the niche that we are in the types of businesses that we work with. And so this needs assessment helps us assess the client and helps them assess us as well to make sure that everybody's gonna be happy with all of this as we go forward. Somebody asked this question, I just saw it over on the questions area. Thank you for asking this, Anthony. KPI is Key Performance Indicator Reporting. So those are key metrics that you might want to look at for a particular type of client. So for example, if you work with nonprofits, they wanna know what fundraising they're doing. And depending on if they are doing fundraising events, they want to know prof, quote unquote profit per fundraising event because sometimes they have expenses. So they want to know what they made off of that fundraising effort or they might want to know what the fundraising has been per student or per staff member or per whatever. Um, and so there's things like that that you might track differently for a nonprofit versus a for-profit. And there might be sales goals and um, budgets and things like that, different types of performance indicators, um, room revenue for hotels and things like that, or, or um, number of turns in their inventory, things like that. 
So there's different types of um, uh, information that you might be tracking with all of that. Okay, so um, then the question is, if you understand those clients, are they a good fit for QuickBooks Online? And so one of the things that um, we have to look at is, the type of client they are and if they're a good fit. If they're terrified of being online, then obviously <laughs> that could be a conversation that you need to have and might take a little longer to have them work with that. Um, but if you want a client, or excuse me, if this client wants to be doing things on a mobile device and they want to be able to use a Mac and you use a PC or vice versa, great, not a problem. That's all a great fit for QuickBooks Online. Um, as I said, they need to be comfortable working online. Um, my dad is not a great fit for QuickBooks Online. He is not going to put anything on the internet if he can help it. He's surprised that they still know where he lives online. So it is not something that, that he's gonna be good with, even though he has a small business. And so that's fine. That's just not where he is. Um, does your client have one or more locations? If that's the case, then the owner may very well need to be able to access their books in multiple places and having it online makes a lot of sense for them to be able to do that. If you have a client that's looking to automate and reduce data entry, um, being able to integrate their bank accounts and their credit cards right into QuickBooks Online to reduce the amount of data entry they have to do and the amount of paperwork that they're kind of dealing with as far as you know reconciling accounts and coding transactions and all this, then this is a great fit for them. Really what we are looking at here is that these days, most businesses can use QuickBooks Online. Now, a lot of them are gonna use it just on its own, plain, simple, not a big deal. But what we're finding is a lot of them are using apps now to integrate with that because what they're seeing is that there's even more capability that they can have that they never had before that integrates right into their accounting system. And so, for example, with my nonprofits, I am able to have a full donor management system that is able to understand information that's readily available on social networks and out publicly available about donors. And now nonprofit executive directors can see that information about the donors that they have in the system. And so those types of things can be helpful. Or they want to be able to allow people to donate online to specific things and they can do that using apps that integrate right into QuickBooks Online, eliminating double entry of information. So again, either alone or with, with an app, they are finding that pretty much most businesses, even as complex as construction and manufacturing, can all work with QuickBooks Online because of the apps that integrate with it. So what are some of the needs that a client might have that are going to really make it make sense for you guys to be working with them? Um, if the client is struggling to complete day-to-day -day bookkeeping, I mean, I think that's pretty much most clients uh, these days, but they really need some help with this. They're doing a lot of data entry, and of course, that means there's some mistakes in there. Um, there's engagement bottlenecks. Um, this happens all the time where we're constantly waiting on files and documentation from clients, but this can be eliminated by using things like QuickBooks Online that are integrated with bank accounts and so on. Um, having remote workforces and being able to have real-time multi-user access. These are all things that can be very problematic and a lot of times the IT needs of the client just balloon in expense because they're having to basically create a network where they could actually just use the internet and be able to access QuickBooks online securely. This last one, oh my goodness, like how many of us are fighting with clients over this? Client loses receipts and other documentation. I mean, I can't tell you the number of clients that I've talked to where they're like, oh, I don't keep receipts. And I'm like, oh, that's so, so cute. But you run a business. We have to be big girls and boys and we have to keep that stuff because there's this organization called the IRS and they kind of want that. So we have to help them. You know, it's easy for you and I to say keep your receipts, but the guy's like, what do I do with them? Um, I just, I had a meeting with a client last month and I was talking about an app that I use with my clients and it's called Receipt Bank and we use it with all of our clients and they put their receipts in there. They can do expense reporting and other stuff. And I said, you, you don't need to have those little thermal paper receipts like all over the place because they fade even just after time, much less in the heat and the cold and whatever. 
And he leaned over and pulls out his wallet. And, and if you know the old Seinfeld, George Costanza episode where he pulls his wallet out and he's like having back problems because it's so thick with stuff, that, that's what he did. And I just literally busted out laughing at this client. And, and he laughed, thankfully, he wasn't offended. But I was just like, oh my word, like we seriously have to clean this up. And all those receipts, eventually he'll just get frustrated and throw them away, but he needs to keep them. And so these are the kinds of things that when I tell the client that we have a solution for that, they are so excited. They don't care if I do their bank reconciliation, just the fact that he doesn't have a wad of receipts becomes a big deal to him. And so this is the kind of stuff that we talk to our clients about and help them with these needs that they have. So this new client checklist, this is a picture of some of the spreadsheets that you have down in uh, that handouts folder in the control panel that you can download. And, and what this is, <clears throat> is a spreadsheet that you can start using to be able to have um, a conversation with your clients and start gathering their needs of what it is that you should be doing with them um, and, and helping them out in their processes. It's a beginning. It's not the be all end all. And I definitely think you need to tweak this for your own purposes in your firm. But I encourage you guys to take a look at this. And if you don't already have an onboarding checklist for your clients, you definitely should be working on that to automate and, and standardize that process. It will make you much, much better and really create a much better experience for your clients and your teams. So once you have that information, then we start looking at the actual features of QuickBooks Online in the various subscriptions. So you can see that there really are four, Simple Start, Essentials, Plus, and Advanced. And then you can see we kind of have this little call out on the right side that says Self-Employed. Technically, Self-Employed is a QuickBooks subscription, but it's not meant as a subscription for a small business that is technically a business. It is really meant for a client that is filing a Schedule C. Um, sometimes it's a side hustle job that they're doing and they're just starting out. It could be an Etsy reseller or a, uh, an Uber or Lyft driver, or it could be somebody who does um, you know, web services on the side, things like that. Um, but typically, you're gonna have one line of business that you are running through self-employed. That is what it's for. There is no balance sheet, bank reconciliation, and all those things. That is what you should have. If you're, if you're needing those things, then you're moving into one of the other QBO subscriptions. So there's an entire course on that, and I highly recommend it to you guys if you're looking at clients that are going to be using QB self-employed. But with the others, Simple Start and so on, Simple Start, if you imagine somebody who's just getting starting out with a lawn mowing service, um, they're just going to start tracking income and expenses. They're a really small company, maybe a sole proprietor even, but they're going to be needing to do some basic things in there, uh, run some basic sales through there, but their, their expenses are probably just on a credit card kind of thing. Then they move on into essentials, that same lawn mowing service. They're tracking income expenses and getting payments, basic reports, and so on, sales taxes in there. But now they actually have bills, and they want to start tracking that a little bit more so they can... Um, do those types of things. There's more than one person that needs to get in. They need help now. And they can even do some basic time tracking in there as well. But once you move on up into QuickBooks Online Plus, now we're getting into a bit more. Now we have five users that could be in the system at any given time. There's project tracking, there's uh, inventory, and so on. So there's class tracking in there as well. So location tracking. Really, QuickBooks Online Plus is a little bit more advanced and a little bit more robust is a better word. Then we get a QBO Advanced, and that is the, the, the top version now of QuickBooks Online with up to 25 users with some really sophisticated reporting that's powered by Fathom. Um, there's more invoicing functionality, more uh, granular user permissions, and so on. So QuickBooks Online Advanced, of all the clients that I'm working with, I only have, I think, one that's on QBO Advanced. The rest of them are running just fine on QBO Plus. Um, if they need the more robust reporting, you can still do that kind of thing because it's an integrated app. It's just not included in it. And so some of, the, some of the clients don't necessarily have to go up to Advanced. So it just depends on the needs of that client. But then now that we really understand that client, we can recommend to them, you know what, 
right now essentials is just fine for you but you know what next year you're probably going to be going up to qbo plus when you open that store um, or when you need to start tracking inventory or whatnot and then as you grow and add all these different locations or class tracking or whatever now we're starting to look at really digging into qbo advanced and and growing your business with that and so they can graduate up in their subscription levels very very easily there all right so one of the things that we also have in that um, new client checklist that you're going to see there is the additional requirements about adding an app and then of course additional information about subscription so you guys can check that out um, one of the things that we often talk about are apps and David I saw your question in there in there that somebody is saying you know what about um, internet access and adding apps and all these different things and is it just the same as it would have been for desktop or whatever those types of things and and cost is always a consideration but there's a whole lot more to that conversation as well again the benefits of using an online application um, i know personally when i speak to clients that are in the mid-market and the functionality that they get there um, small business clients can now have that using quickbooks online and apps and quite honestly a lot of the functionality that um, people were often looking in the core application. Um, there's so much more that these apps now offer that I definitely encourage you guys to check it out. Um, reducing data entry with seamless integration is extremely important. Um, many times we find that people are just keying in information from one place to another. We really want to eliminate that as much as possible, as well as adding the additional functionality to an existing process. So we have time tracking right? Um, but with T-Sheets, which is now owned by QuickBooks, um, T-Sheets is not just time tracking. It does more than that. It also does GPS tracking. It integrates with the payroll system so that now as soon as my hours are in, somebody can approve those and send them straight over to the payroll application. And it's crazy easy to use. They don't have to go get a time clock and stick it on the wall. They can use facial recognition. Now that's not something that we had before. They can use facial recognition to see who they are so we don't have their buddies checking them in. Um, and so there's other things that apps uh, are doing for our clients that they never had that functionality before. And the theft of time is really a big deal. And so just that's just one example, but there's so many others of things that we want to do for our clients that they couldn't do before on a desktop type of application. We also have the ability to move processes outside of QuickBooks so that we can keep the information secure. I have a not-for-profit that has a store and we're able to keep those um, salespeople inside of a separate application so they're not accessing the overall financial information of the organization. The store staff is just in their application and so Things like that can happen. So we can really separate duties that way. And of course, we can supercharge what they're doing. Um, the ability to have a system that they can go into and track uh, maybe more detailed information about sales or inventory values um, and classes and locations and all these things regarding their inventory, that's a really big deal. And for some small businesses um, to go buy a much more expensive product and servers and maintenance of all of that, is really cost prohibitive and so it is a much more reasonable expense uh, for them and a great return on that investment and so I definitely encourage you guys uh, to look at these apps now I realize that it can be a little overwhelming to think of you know oh my gosh there's so many apps but that's one of the reasons that I encourage you to narrow down uh, the types of clients you work with and not take every single one of them that comes in the door because then you have a whole new suite of apps that you might have to learn and processes and workflows if you narrow that down a bit, it does make your life a whole lot easier and you don't have to learn every app. So check out apps.com to search for Intuit approved apps and that helps as well. And then you can read reviews and review. And again, once you know the needs of your clients, it's gonna make it easier to decide which ones you want to work with. Now we're gonna go ahead and launch another polling question. And while I do that, I'm going to look over some of these questions because you guys have been asking some great ones so I love that so remember this is not graded but this is important for you to answer if you're doing CPE which is the only QBO subscription level that includes inventory of the ones that are listed there 
And so while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and um, so Lisa, that's a great question. Um, I had been using Receipt Bank before Intuit had the app inside their own application. So QBO does have the ability to capture receipts inside the application. So that's a great question. You are so smart. Um, and you're absolutely right. QBO does have that service to take a picture of receipts right inside of the application that was just released here in the past month or two. And so yes, you're absolutely uh, correct on that. So great question. Um, Let's see, somebody wanted to know about integrating with legal practice management software. It depends on that software. Um, so I don't know that I have an exact answer on that. Somebody wants to know about hairstylists for self-employed. That could definitely work for them, uh, depending on what their needs are. Um, let's see, uh, somebody else wants to know. Somebody's laughing about the wallet story. Isn't that funny? Uh, our banks, um, Debit card transactions going into QuickBooks Online, that happens already because those are bank transactions, so that does happen. Um, so that's all there. And then somebody said my voice sounded funny, so I don't know if their internet was messed up or if it really does sound that bad. But anyway, so we'll be doing that. Um, so, all right, I'm going to go ahead and close down the polling question in three, two, and one. And so the... Um, answer is which QuickBooks subscription level includes inventory and the answer is QuickBooks Online Plus. So Simple Start is just like that brand new business that's mostly dealing with sales. Um, that's all that's in Simple Start. Essentials graduates up and starts doing a little bit more of the payable side of it um, and a few other things obviously but I kind of think of it as Simple Start as sales. Uh, Essentials adds in the inventory. QBO Plus is, is really going to add in a lot of the functionality, class tracking, location tracking. Uh, it has limits, but, but that functionality is there. And then, of course, QuickBooks Online Self-Employed is not meant for anybody that has a balance sheet. And inventory is sitting on the balance sheet. And so QuickBooks Self-Employed is not really designed for that. They would need to be using QBO Plus and, and doing that. So, um, of course, we don't have listed here QBO Advanced. Of course, Advanced does because it's more robust than Plus. So it includes everything in Plus and then some. Great, awesome. So, um, and then, okay, somebody had a different, had to change devices, so my voice isn't that bad. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought it must just be my Southern accent. Anyway, just kidding. Okay, so now we're gonna dive in and get going on setting up a new QBO company. So we're gonna go ahead and dive into creating that subscription, converting from desktop and getting into QBO and getting that set up. I am gonna stick to slides a good bit just because I think it's easier and there's a lot of content that I wanna make sure I go through. And though you don't have an exam at the end of this session, there's no, this is not part of the certification uh, course itself, it is still good information that you should know if you're converting a client and also it is uh, really a foundational course for the certification course. So it's really important for you to know this. So I'm gonna stick to slides a good bit. Now, as we're logging in, we are logged in as the accountant. And we can tell that because in the top left up here on this screenshot in the background here, it says QB accountant. It also has a green bar across the top of it. And so we are logged in as the accountant and we're on the clients tab. And there in the top right is where you're gonna find is add client. But if you're in QBO, that's where you add new transactions, you add a new customer, like the top right is where you add things. So just kind of have that in your mind. Then you're gonna go in and once you click on add client, you need to tell QBO about that client. What is the name of the business or potentially the individual, but typically it's a business and you would enter in their information in here. And then you would determine what their subscription is going to be. Now. Before we even decide the subscription, who's paying for the subscription? So every client in QuickBooks Online is going to have a subscription that they pay for. And who is gonna do that? Is it gonna be you as the firm or is it going to be the client? And that is the conversation that we have right here. Now, when we start talking about if the firm is going to pay for that subscription, the reason that question is being asked is because there is going to be um, a discount applied if they are doing it through the firm, okay? If they are, if the subscription is paid for by the accounting firm, then there is a 50% discount for the life of that subscription. So if the price goes up, 
then the subscription discount stays as 50% off that current retail price, okay? So if it was $10, they get it for five. If it changes the price to $15, it's now 750. You get the idea, right? And so, but it is billed to the firm. The firm can then decide if they are going to eat the cost of that subscription or if they're going to pass it on to a client and have them be reimbursing you for the cost of that subscription or you're marking it up and you're gonna charge them full retail even though you got it at 50% off and that's fine depending on where you are and your sales tax considerations and all of that. Obviously, the idea here is obviously you follow the rules. Some states have told, some accountants have told me that their state says they can't mark it up. Others say that they're allowed to have it reimbursed. Others say they can mark it up all they want, whatever. You guys decide how you wanna do that. But the point is that the firm would pay and it would be at that 50% discount. And so, you would identify that and you can see here that's what it tells you it's 50 percent off for the life of the subscription you would identify whichever subscription and then you would also be able to identify which team members inside the firm are going to have access to that client okay by the way if they're not doing wholesale then they are doing what we call direct billing where the client is paying for it themselves with their own you know credit card being put into the system when they log in if the client is paying for it they pay retail, though there could be a promotional discount that's offered at the beginning. It is not going to be the same as the same discount that we get as uh, pro advisors. So just wanted to mention that real quick. All right. So once a client has been added and they have a new subscription, you're going to see them listed in your client list. And again, this is inside QBOA on your client list. And you would see them listed here. And you can see what's highlighted in red. Those are the icons that we would use to access the client's books, or as I showed in a previous session in this intro series, that we can use the client switcher that's up here in the top left. So either click on the icon or choose the client switcher to actually go into the client's books. Once you're in the client's books, they're gonna ask you a couple more questions. If you, as the accounting professional, are setting up their books, then you may go in there and you know have their information in there and then either say you've been using QB desktop and want to bring in your data or it could be that it's asking you some other basic information if i have these questions come to me i usually just click all set and i don't even bother clicking them because i'm going to configure it all separately anyway so this is nice that it asks me this information but i usually just click all set and and don't worry about it and go on in fact even if i'm converting from desktop i might just click all set and just keep going may not even check the box doesn't mean I can never convert them from desktop it just keeps me from going through their little wizard okay now let's talk about that conversion from QuickBooks desktop because there are a ton of uh, conversations and things that we want to um, discuss as we go through this process now um, Okay, so somebody wants to know um, about how getting invited by a client affect, affects this, and it doesn't. That means that the client owns the subscription, so it's direct billed. And so that's typically what that means. Um, and so also I wanted to point out, and I appreciate, I think it was Woody that posted that there, is that there is a ton of best practice videos that he put a link to down in the chat area, and you guys can capture that URL and take a look at those. Don't watch them now because we're still in class, but later on you could do that as well. Um, and so there's some things there as well. So we're gonna dive into talking about converting from QuickBooks Desktop. And um, as we do this, there's a couple things that I wanted to mention to you. And there is a, um, and, and it actually involves Woody too, but there is a um, fellow colleague named Stacy Kildall who, along with Woody and and um, and Richard Ropa, they have a QBO show. And if you were to Google that again, do that later. Don't do it now. Um, if you do Google QBO show, they have a fantastic site full of information, including feature comparisons. And that was one of the questions I think I saw in the chat there. That what are the features of this app versus that, like QuickBooks Desktop versus QBO and the various subscription levels. That might be something of interest to you and you can find that on QBO show and I'm sure Woody would be awesome to put the link in there for us um, so we can look at it but when we convert clients from desktop to QBO there are definitely some steps you have to go through 
to make sure things are running smoothly. And again, you guys can access a lot of information in the help center of QuickBooks, um, as well as being able to look at things like QBO Show and see on their website where they have some listings there. But if you've already gone through those two wizards that we the at the very beginning, right when you first open up the QBO file, we can still do this by clicking in the top right corner in the gear icon. And in the gear icon, this is kind of where we configure QuickBooks Online. And so we don't have time to go through all of the settings in there. We do that in the certification course. But what you will see is that there's an option here that says import desktop data. And when you do that, it is going to take you to the screen that you see here. And it is going to have a ton of information for you right here. So there's going to be a, a link for importing from QuickBooks Desktop Enterprise. Um, and you can also see that if you don't even have desktop and you're getting a client's file, you could download a trial version of QuickBooks Desktop and then use that to do the conversion. But it'll walk you through some very important things about QuickBooks Desktop and how to export the data and what all is going on here. And there are some tutorials and some other things here that could be really helpful for you. My firm does not do any QuickBooks desktop whatsoever. We don't have any clients that are not in the cloud, but we have a subscription for QuickBooks desktop because I call it a subscription because we renew it every year. We have that because we get client files and we convert them. We just did one this week. And so getting their file, accessing it, reviewing it, and then, and then upgrading it up to uh, QuickBooks online. These are the basic steps before you actually do the conversion that you need to do before you get started. Like just right off the bat, couple quick things. You need to know how many targets there are in QuickBooks Desktop and I'm gonna show you this in a moment. Then you're gonna to need to make sure that the actual file is located on a local drive before you get started. You need to update QuickBooks Desktop with the latest version, as well as verify and rebuild the data and make a backup file. These are the overall steps, and now we're gonna dive into each one of these. Again, if you guys don't have this handout downloaded, it would really be helpful if you did. So, first thing we do is we check the number of targets in QuickBooks Desktop. So, QuickBooks Desktop is going to have an option in there, right? When you just log into the desktop file, you select F2, F as in Frank, 2 and it pulls up the screen you see here. Probably not a screen you've ever looked at before, and that's okay. Uh, we're just looking at one field for right now, and that is the one that says total targets. It needs to be less than 350,000 in order to use the built-in conversion tool and receive the details of transactions. You could still do it, but it would only import the list information if it was more than 350,000. If it's more than 350,000 and it, you want to have data converted over besides just the list, you want transaction data, you might want to make a backup of desktop and then purge some really old information. Some of you have clients that have been using QuickBooks Desktop since Moby Dick was a tadpole, right? They've been in it for 50 years. So we need to get rid of some old stuff out of there and that might pull their targets down to a workable number. And so that's what we would recommend to you. But F2 to see this screen, look at the number of targets they have and make sure that it is less than 350,000 and that will help you a whole bunch. Somebody wants to know what a target is. It is actually the number of lines in a transaction. So if you think about an invoice to a customer, how many ways did you split up that invoice or how many items did you sell on each line of that transaction? Those are the targets. Super techie, we talk about that in QuickBooks Online Advanced Certification. So that's all I'm gonna say for now, but um, hopefully that's a little bit helpful. All right, so then the next thing that I mentioned to you was that we needed to have the QuickBooks, the QBW, that's the extension of the file name. Uh, we need that to be local. So it needs to be found, you, you can see the location of it right here, and you can see that it's on the C drive and it's local. I have heard, I personally haven't experienced, but I have heard that we need to make sure that it's not buried beneath like 20 directories here. But for the purposes of our conversation, it is needing to make sure that it's on the local drive, not a server. That's really important. So if you're on the server doing the conversion, that's one thing. But if you're sitting on a workstation accessing the data file, which is on a server, then 
that's going to be an issue for you. If it is local and there's still an issue, it could be that it's buried too deep in like 15 directories. So that might be a consideration to move that file for when you actually do the conversion. But for the purposes of here, make sure it's local is the biggest thing that we want to have you do. All right. Um, yes, I agree, Brian. It's not quite been 50 years <laughs> that QV has been around. Um, so let's see. The next thing we need to do is update QuickBooks Desktop. Now, something to consider here. If you think about the fact that you're talking right now, we're doing all this stuff on desktop. We're actually using QuickBooks Desktop to convert the files up to QuickBooks Online. So to have the most up-to-date conversion tool that's built into QuickBooks Desktop, they need to update it and have the latest updates on that software. So what you do is go into QuickBooks Desktop, go to Help, and choose Update QuickBooks Desktop. It will go into Intuit servers and do whatever magic stuff happens on the back end of desktop software, and it updates that to the latest one. It is not upgrading you to the version 2019 or anything. It's just upgrading that version of QuickBooks Desktop to the latest. Now, we also tell you that you need to be converting from a supported version of QuickBooks Desktop. So no, you can't go back to 1998 version of QuickBooks Desktop and convert that file that's still in the 98 version up to QuickBooks Online. It needs to be a supported version, which is uh, the last two or three years, I believe. But again, for purposes of today, it is go to help and make sure you have updated QuickBooks Desktop. But if they are on a very, very old version, then they would need to get upgraded of QuickBooks Desktop and then do the conversion. So that's something to consider as well. Um, when I moved into my neighborhood 13 years ago, no, it's been longer than that, uh, a while. <laughs> um, that was the, ver the, the QuickBooks Desktop version that we had. Nobody was going to upgrade it. Nobody's going to update it. And so we were on like the 1922 version. Again, I'm being very facetious, but it was old. It was really old. And so we converted them to QuickBooks Online and it has been awesome because now our neighbors are paying their bills on time and so on. So it, it really has changed things, but we find that people are still using very, very old versions of QuickBooks Desktop. And so they need to be on a newer one in order to convert. We also need to verify the data um, you do that by clicking on the file inside of QuickBooks Desktop and then choose Utilities and Verify Data. And then we need to possibly rebuild the data. And this is basically doing some indexing. And if you're not familiar with that, that's okay. It's just a beautiful um, term that databases use that kind of cleans it up a bit and, and uh, shuffles the papers and makes them all align up really nicely inside doesn't really have paper, but if you kind of think of it that way, that's what it's doing. And so it's just really kind of organizing the data a bit more. And so that's what's happening uh, when you do this. And of course, we want to have a backup of the data. I really want a backup of the data before this, but for sure afterwards, we also recommend you have a local backup. And so those are the steps of things you do in desktop before you've even converted. Once that's happened, then you actually do the conversion. So you click on company, export company file to QBO. Sign into QBO and select the company. And clearly, you can see this is a very important decision. You need to make sure you're selecting the correct company to put this data into because if there is something in there, it will get rid of it. So be very careful of that um, and move that forward. Once the conversion has happened, and that time can be uh, variable depending on the type of uh, data or the size database that you're converting. It can happen in minutes or it can take several hours. Typically, it's very, very quick, but you'll get an email confirmation that says it's been done. And then you will also receive a summary report of what has happened. It will tell you exactly what happened, what converted, and so on. And if there's some issues, they're going to tell you about that. Um, you can see that there's some links here to additional um, things that you might want to look at. There were some accounts that didn't convert, um, and it might tell you why that is and so on. Once the conversion has happened, then go into QuickBooks Desktop and QuickBooks Online both and run the financial statements. You want to run both the P&L and the balance sheet for all dates and run it in accrual basis. Now, 
the client may be on cash basis and so on, that's okay. We're just confirming that everything converted properly. This is just our, our checks on it. I personally run more than just this, but this is the minimum. Run it, run the PL and the balance sheet all date in desktop and QBO and make sure that they tie. And then uh, you have a better uh, feeling that things have gone the way they should. So I've seen a few questions coming in. I'm going to go ahead and launch another polling question and then I will take a look at those questions. So somebody wants to know if you can convert from QuickBooks Desktop 2014. I do believe you'll need to upgrade uh, up to a newer version of desktop. Um, let's see, somebody wants to know about purchasing a newer desktop version before they're able to convert to QBO. If you have one, you may be able to do that for them. Um, and somebody wants to know if you have a client with 2014, what should I do? You should convert them <laughs> for sure, um, but you are probably going to need to upgrade them to a new version of QuickBooks Desktop. And so um, you can get a trial version and convert them up and then do it. You could leave their data in desktop 2014 since that's the version they own, but um, you would need to convert it up a bit higher in order to uh, make sure that's gonna go successfully. All right. What's a, is it a good idea to back up the QuickBooks desktop data before you convert it? And if so, why? And so um, there's some options there. Again, we're not grading this, so go ahead and answer it. I'm gonna close down the poll in three, two, and one. And the survey says that um, we want to have a backup of the QuickBooks desktop data before we convert it um, so that if there is an issue, um, you can go back to a restore point and start over. It's not gonna prevent errors. Um, you could have a power failure in the middle and there's gonna be an error. Um, not likely, but obviously uh, we wanna have a backup. It's not gonna prevent that, but it is going to give us that restore point. And so that's there. So, and thank you for the 4% of you that had no idea. Awesome, that's okay. That's why we go over the answers to that. So that's what we do. Great, so let's go ahead and keep on going. And in this time, we're gonna go through some of those settings. So I mentioned before we didn't have time, now we're gonna take that time. So in the gear icon, we go to account and settings, and this is where we're going to be configuring QuickBooks Online to work for our client. And so when we go in there, you're gonna see that these are the different sections that we're gonna be in. You're gonna notice on the far right side, there's a pencil, and that's what we select in order to edit the information over here. Although, honestly, I think you can click on that and still edit it, but that little pencil means you can edit. Just make sure you save it and then click Done in order to apply that setting to QBO. So first we have our company settings, and in here we can put in the client's logo, which I definitely recommend. They get very excited about that. Their name, the company name, the FEIN, and so on. So that information is really important. Go ahead and fill all of this out. And yes, I do recommend that you put in their address and all of that um, and confirm if you've converted from desktop that that is correct. Some people have not updated their, um, the, they have not updated their address in a very, very long time. So definitely encourage you to do that. Um, then you have the billing and subscription information. This may look like this, especially if your client has paid for their own subscription. If you have them on wholesale billing, you may not see the billing and subscription section because it is on your wholesale bill. If you're not sure uh, what subscription they're on and you want to know, there should be an overview tab inside of QBO on the top left when you log in as the accountant and that will tell you, or you can hover over their QBO um, icon and it'll tell you that as well if you're looking at them from the client list. But this information is good to see as well. Then we have something that is referring, referring to usage limits. With QuickBooks Online Plus, you can have up to five users. And so this screen is telling you how many users they currently have, what the number of chart of accounts is and their classes and locations. And as they start inching toward the top end of that, you might be considering them moving on into the next subscription level um, just from a uh, feature usage per, uh, perspective, not necessarily from a functionality. There may be other functions they need in the next version, but this is strictly about some of the usages that might move them into the next category. This is where we put in our sales settings, and there's quite a few here that we go over um, and discuss, and we discuss a bit more of this in our certification course, but you can customize the look and feel of the invoices 
um, that your client is going to send out, which is really important. They like those to look pretty because it represents them. Although I have some clients that never send an invoice because they do retail sales or donations or whatever. Um, we also have various sales form content that we can add, um, custom fields, custom transaction numbers, and so on, and products and services. And the way that we might configure those, you can tell this client is at least on QBO plus or higher because it talks about having inventory tracked and it's turned on. So we know they're at least in plus, if not advanced. Regarding the customization of sales forms, um, when you select this option, it actually goes to this page and this is where you would be able to go in and customize those invoices, creating copies of the standard templates and creating your own and so on. So that can be really, really helpful. And again, um, this is a fantastic service that you're providing and hopefully you are charging them for. Um, those, are, those are value to those clients. We also have some expense settings that we take a look at. And one of the things that we often don't consider um, is that we might be selling items, but we may also be purchasing items. And so if you are, then you may want to be tracking that on expense and, and purchase forms, and you would turn that on here. I also have clients that have expenses um, and items that they need to track by customer. Of course, we already have revenue by customer, but now we could actually track expenses by customer, just with the click of a button to turn that on. And now we would identify that when we enter transactions and again, provide more operational um, reporting for our clients to help them run their businesses better. We can also choose to make expenses and items billable on occasion. So you might pay for something on behalf of a client and need to charge them for it. And so you could choose to do that. Also in QBO Plus, we have the ability to use purchase orders and be able to track that type of um, workflow as well. And so that would be here and you can enable that also. One of the areas that I think we definitely need to be talking to our clients about a lot of times is the ability to use the integrated QuickBooks payments functionality. It allows us to have QuickBooks payments um, that we can store ACH, which is like their bank account information or credit card information. It's all secure, PCI compliant. We can store that information for our customers and then be able to accept those payments or use that payment method um, on a sales receipt. So first of the month, I have my sales receipts go automatically out to my customers and they pay me at the beginning of the month automatically. Um, and so I do that by using QuickBooks payments. Or if I have a client that, you know, every once in a while there's a random charge we need to charge, then we can do the same thing uh, using the card that we have on file. And so we would configure that all here. Um, I did this with one client, um, actually kind of selfishly, it was one of my vendors and I told her about it. She was really excited about this, started doing this with me, rolled it out with all of her clients where she could have them pay online. And now she's actually converted all of them to be automatic sales receipts. So she never gets checks anymore. It's just automatically deposited. She doesn't have to worry about her billing. It's just, she was already doing flat fees. And so this works out beautifully for her and um, it's totally transformed her cash flow. Um, and so that's fantastic. We have some advanced settings that we also need to look at for our clients as well. And this is really important because what we're finding here is that um, a lot of the people that are setting up QuickBooks Online don't know about some of these features and it can really help their businesses quite a bit. And so our job as we work with our clients is to help them make sure that they've set up QuickBooks to run properly for them. Some of our clients um, don't need to be in here. In fact, I tell my clients that if they come in here, I'm gonna smack their hand. And I joke around with that. I'm not really gonna hit them, but um, I do want them to know this is not an area they should be tinkering with. However, I know their business really well and so I can configure this so that it works best for them. Um, we can enable account numbers. Some of our clients don't use account numbers and some of them do, and it depends on the client. And so we can enable that. And I know that some of you are like, oh my gosh, an accounting system that doesn't have numbers. It's okay, it's still debits and credits and they equal. It's just that there's no account number. And, and for some of my clients, that's fine. Uh, others, it would drive them crazy if it alphabetized their chart of accounts, right? So it just depends on the client. We also could choose to mark up uh, their billable expenses and that's where we would do some of that here. 
this is where we enable the ability to have class tracking like for departments and um, types of sales depending on the client. Um, I have one client that has departments and then they also have, um, they sell four major book sets online. And so sometimes they'll market one book set over another book set. And so they have expenses um, for each book set. And so we actually will go in and um, run a P&L for those book sets. So I can see the income, cost of sales, and the expenses. And so that works out really well for them. We can also have locations and things like that. And then there's some automation on how you might work with a client as well. And so those are some things that um, you want to take a look at for your clients on that advanced area. Scrolling down that page a little bit, this is where we would turn on the ability to do project tracking, which is fantastic. Some of you were used to that, calling it job costing. It's called project tracking in QBO. Some basic time tracking capability. Some of you are working with clients that have multiple currencies. I have one that um, works with um, the South African RAND, and so we are doing multi-currency for them, and it works beautifully because those rates are managed um, through an integration that QBO has and it's maintained automatically. So I don't have to put in a, an exchange rate, it just does it for me. So all of those types of things um, are available here along with some additional settings. So it's a quick review of all these advanced settings and obviously we could camp out and talk about scenarios of each one of these for a long time. But again, as I said in the previous webinar that I had done, I encourage you guys that you're using QBO, you'll get to know these and as you bring clients on, you're gonna know them even more. Um, and of course, you have a sample company where you can go in and play around with these settings and see what happens. Um, and of course, there's help for these as well. I'm gonna go ahead and launch our next polling question. And then I'm gonna look over some questions here as well and um, ask you some of those. Um, let's see. Uh, Carla's wanting to know about donations and would love to track, talk with you about that. Um, I actually use an app for that. And so I don't actually do that inside of QBO, although, um, I do know that there are others that have used um, some donation forms and you would change like the invoice to say something a little bit different or a sales receipt as well. Typically, it's probably more the sales receipt and you can configure that form under the customizing form styles. You could configure that form to use as a sales receipt. All right. So um, why, which QuickBooks Online features can't be turned off once we turn them on? I didn't really talk about this a ton, so this is a good uh, kind of a conversation that we're gonna have as you guys get through with this question. And so we'll go through that. Um, so let's see. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and close down the poll in three, two, and one. All right, so let's talk about these questions here are these uh, conversations here. So which QuickBooks Online features can't be turned off once they are turned on? Well, accounts receivable, uh, I that's kind of an interesting one. Technically, um, I, you never turn it on, so it's just there. <laughs> um, inventory um, and purchase orders, I think you, actually you can turn those off. Obviously, if you turn off inventory, you know, you, you've got some issues. If You can't do it if there's inventory in there. Um, projects and currency those are not being turned off. Once you have turned on multi-currency, it does not ever go off. And so that stays on. Projects are really pretty much the same way as well. Class and location tracking, actually you could turn that off if you no longer want to use that anymore. So really the answer is projects and currency. So, um, but good questions there. Again, you never turn on AR, so it's not ever gonna be turned off uh, anyway. So, awesome, great question. Um, let's see. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hide those results and let's keep on going. All right, so let's talk about um, adding users. So once we have configured QuickBooks Online and kind of got it set up, that's about the time that I'm ready to add people in. Couple quick things. All QuickBooks Online subscriptions include two free accountant firm users. Now, when we say QuickBooks subscriptions, we mean Simple Start Essentials Plus and Advanced not self-employed. QuickBooks self-employed is just one accountant firm. So that's a totally different beast. But on regular QBO, then there are already two accountant firm users. Now that doesn't mean two people at my firm. 
it means my firm plus another firm, which is good because my firm, I might have four people accessing some of my larger clients doing various things for the client serving as backup when somebody goes on maternity leave or is on vacation or just needs extra help. So I have, I am one accountant firm user, but I have my team that could access it. But then there could be another accountant in there, which is good because I don't do their taxes and their tax accountant needs to log in. And again, they may have multiple people in their firm that are working in the client's file. So what we're talking about here are the users that are from the client side doing work in the books on a day-to-day -day basis or reviewing things, looking at things. And so this chart will be really helpful. You guys can read it um, and see that you can have one in Simple Start up to three users in QBO Essentials, up to five and plus and 25 in advance. And you can kind of see the various things that they can do there. So to add a new user, you would go to the gear icon inside of the QBO file and then click on manage users and then be able to add them in just simply select new enter in their information and they're good to go um, this screen has changed a tad i believe since this screenshot was done there are now two tabs here one is users and one is accounting firms and so um, but as you can see here there are two accounting firms in this one when you get ready to add in a custom user you would identify a user type um, being the regular or custom user, and then you would specify the rights that that person would have in accessing QBO. Again, for more granular permissions, they would need to be using QBO Advanced, but this is going to give you some ability to lock down the types of information they can see. You then have some additional administrative rights and what they can do as far as adding other users, changing information in the company setup, which is definitely not something I want to see a lot of, or even managing their subscriptions um, that they have. You would enter in their name and email address and then invite them in. They will then receive an email that says, hi, you know, whoever has invited you into their QBO file, and they would simply select accept, create a username, and then be able to um, access the QBO file based on the um, uh, permissions that you've given them. Now, once I have done this, what I'm going to have is a client that is now able to log into QBO. Now, I typically might wait even a little bit longer before I invite them in, but really that depends on you guys and what it is that you're wanting to do. Um, when we are working with a client, uh, one of the first things that we're going to do is start looking at their chart of accounts. That's one of the first things um, that uh, we're going to do. And you can see here that that's what we're doing by accessing the chart of accounts on the bottom left corner, going to the accounting tab, and then going to chart of accounts. Um, so once we log in, we're able to go in and review the chart of accounts, edit it, we can go in there and search for a, an account. We can run a report on the chart of accounts, add new ones, and so on. Um, we also, just to select new, as I said, the top right corner is where we doing, um, uh, we do most of our new things. Um, we would then identify the type of account this is and identify a unique name and then decide if it's an account or a sub account. Now, if you're not familiar with subaccounts, um, this allows me to have subtotals on the financial statements as an example. So I might have repairs and maintenance as an account, but then I want to have uh, repairs and maintenance to equipment versus the automobile versus the building versus the tools, whatever, and have a subtotal for all repairs and maintenance. And so those individual accounts could be uh, subaccounts. So that's what we would do there. Um, let me back up. I forgot to mention about the account type. We would identify if it's things like an asset, a liability, owner's equity, income, expenses, and so on. You can get a little bit more granular than that, even in the account type, and then even way more so on the detail type. And then, of course, the name has to be unique. So you can add new accounts and so on. Again, we discussed this even more in the certification course. We also need to be setting up products and services for our clients. And so we would do that under the sales tab, products and services. 
Um, and when we do that, these are the ways that we're going to sell services and products to our customers, to, to our client's customer. And so these are the various types of products and services, depending on the subscription level that they have in QBO. Then you can see to the right which of these various types of items they would be using to um, sell to their customers. Obviously, inventory items where you're tracking quantities is only available in QBO Plus and Advanced. Non-inventory items are available to anybody, and they're products and services that you sell, but you don't necessarily track, like nuts and bolts or whatever. Um, services, of course, everybody can use, um, selling landscaping, tax prep, consulting, whatever. Um, and then a bundle is a grouping of items that are sold together, and they give the example of a gift basket that includes wine and cheese and fruit, that type of thing. Keep in mind that bundles are not assemblies, and that is one distinction I wanted to make mention of. Once we decide what type of product or service we are going to uh, be setting up, we would give it a unique name, enter in a SKU if you are using that, a category if you want to have groupings of your items for reporting purposes, and then identify if you're selling this product, a default description, a default sales price, and then the income account that it is going to credit when you sell that item. You would set up all of those that you need. You can always add more later and you can edit those. So we've set up our chart of accounts, we've set up our products and services, and now we're ready to go ahead and start setting up customers. You could um, set up an individual customer this way or you can do it on the fly later on, but typically we would recommend that you would set up some of your customers like this and you would enter in their basic information here. And there's a lot more that we could discuss one thing I always point out, the payment and billing area is where you store their credit card or ACH information securely if you're using QuickBooks Payments. And also keep in mind that we also have an attachments uh, capability here where you could literally store things like a resale certificate, lease agreement, or other specific information about a customer that you want to make sure is getting backed up and that you and the client both have access to. And so that can be really helpful to do right inside of QBO. Each file is up to, I think, 20 or 25 megs, but it's unlimited. You could have 15, 20 meg files attached to a customer if you needed to. So um, I would definitely utilize that. You would set up vendors pretty much the same way. The one distinction here is, of course, identifying those that need to be tracked for 1099 purposes. And you would be able to do that here and then later be able to process 1099s directly out of QuickBooks Online. Now, if you guys are like me, you don't want to manually be entering in all of that information. Not only will I not do it, my clients don't want to do it. So let's import that stuff in if they didn't convert from desktop, right? If they did convert from desktop, it's still possible we still need to import some information in. But um, you would do that on the gear icon under import data. When you do this, you're going to see that we have the ability to import bank information, which is a little separate conversation, but that is part of it. Um, customers, vendors, products and services, and our chart of accounts can all be imported in. And when you do this, the good thing is, is that QBO did not say figure out what the file format should be. They gave you some sample files that you could actually complete and use to import in the data itself. And so they provide that for you. You could download that. They put sample information in there so you can see the format and then be able to use that and import that right into QBO. When you do this, you can map that information. So if you're not using the actual file, but you could map that information in, review it, and import that in. I do recommend that you have opening balances of zero. There's another way to enter in those beginning balances if you're doing this. We also want you to connect these bank feeds. This is super important that you connect the bank feeds for all bank and credit cards that your client has and in their books. Um, I have a client that I just converted this week and I noticed that they were making credit card payments and I didn't see the credit card on the books. They never had put it in there. So we converted them to QBO and I've already warned the owner, you're gonna need to connect that. All of your credit card stuff should be coming into QBO. So we're keeping balances correct and your expenses are in there even if you haven't paid that credit card bill yet. And so we're gonna have a lot better tracking of what they have going on in their business. And so get those bank feeds going early on. You would log in using 
um, the login credentials that they would use to access their bank account. Some of my clients are giving me read-only access and it allows me to do this with some banks. Some banks it doesn't. I've done a quick little video that I send them using an app called Loom that's free, by the way. Um, and I do a quick little video that says, this is how you set up your bank fee. Just walk through this and then go do that in QBO and let me know when it's done. And bam, they get it taken care of and I never see their login information and it's all done securely and the clients love that. So super easy to have them do that. You would just simply connect it. Remember this account is already in your chart of accounts. Now all you're doing is populating it with information from the bank but again, remember, it's not just posting it straight to the GL. You guys will have time to review those bank feeds and determine where that goes in QBO. It's not gonna just throw it all in there. So do this, it's going to save you a lot of time. And again, we go through much more of this detail in the certification course. But you identify which account at the bank is gonna go to which account in your chart of accounts, and then it'll start populating the bank feed. Some banks, you are able to just go back a few months. QBO and Intuit have worked diligently to make the connectivity with the banks better and better and better. Um, and they are able to now go back much further. Some banks are even allowing you to go back further than a year. So it's really fantastic. So a lot of these banks were able to pull in information um, for a good amount of time and have that information brought into QBO. And again, it's sitting there waiting for you to process, not just throwing it into the GL wherever it feels like it. We also can set up rules so that we can automatically record certain transactions. I have clients that are paying for monthly subscriptions for various things, and they don't even get receipts. Sometimes they get a notification that says it's been processed, but I can just go ahead and automatically code those transactions. Um, and so we can set up bank rules so that those transactions I don't have to click on every month. They just happen automatically and it just goes straight to their GL and it matches to what's happened in the bank account, done. And so we can set that up, but you can get into some really sophisticated rules that say if the water bill is under $50, automatically code it. But if it's over that, leave it here because I need to be alerted right away that they're having a water leak somewhere, things like that. You can do some really cool things inside their bank feed. To create a new bank rule, you would go through, give it a name, identify the criteria. In this case, they set up a bank rule that says when it's any of these gas stations, just code it as an expense to gas, uh, to gas stations and automobile. And in this case, they're also using classes. That's awesome. Makes it so much easier because your client doesn't care how much they spell it shell, spend it shell versus mobile versus BP versus whatever. So this just makes it all super handy for the client to make sure things are getting updated like they should. I have another polling question to launch, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now and look over a few questions as well. And then we're gonna round out our conversation here in just a few minutes. Awesome, go ahead and answer that polling question. Uh, there is no additional charge for using bank and credit card fees, at least not from QBO. I don't think most banks do it either, but I've never run into one, but I'm sure there's probably somewhere someone that does. Um, uh, I have not seen my clients being charged for using bank fees personally. Um, let's see. Um, David wants to know, do you do bookkeeping on the back side of it or do you do it with source documents? It depends on the client and whether they'll actually give me the source documents. Um, I am pretty adamant with my clients that they're keeping receipts and giving them to me. In fact, one of my nonprofits, I had a meeting with them right before this webinar and I said, you know, I haven't heard from you guys until I started loading things into an account called missing receipts and then boy, did they call quick. So um, I actually do it with source documents rather than, um, you know, just slamming stuff in. So it just depends on the client and, and the type of work you're doing with them. So it, it really does depend. Great question. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close down the polling question in three, two, and one. And the question is, what type of data can't be imported in using the import data tool in QBO? The customer list can, the vendor list can, product services can, and the chart of accounts can be imported in. The currency list is already being maintained for you because QBO is doing that. So you're not importing in the currency list. 
And so uh, there's all the other types can be imported in. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a few more things. Payroll is a big conversation with a lot of our clients. And so there are two uh, types of payroll that you can have with QuickBooks Online. One of them, I call it a DIY, but a self-service payroll or full service payroll. They're really very competitively priced um, and are fantastic options because it's completely integrated right into QBO and your clients don't have to worry about booking the liabilities properly or not, thank goodness, because they can't do that for anything, it seems. Uh, and so this is just built right in and works beautifully for them. And so they can either do a self-service where they have to click a button to tell the system to e-file the taxes, but um, it does do direct deposited e-files and all those things, but you have to tell it when to pay the taxes. Whereas full service payroll, you don't have to worry about, they, it is like a white glove service. They just take care of everything. And then they also make sure taxes are filed on time and so on. To set it up, you go to the workers tab on the left, select employees and then get started. And they will walk you through that process. And again, you have, well, now we call it enhanced. Sometimes they call it self-service, sometimes it's enhanced, but it is this payroll or the full service payroll. I personally do recommend this one. In fact, all of my clients, except for one who does everything, I, I just host their QBO subscription. I actually don't do any bookkeeping for them. She does do the enhanced payroll, um, but otherwise all of my clients that I'm working with on a regular basis are using full service payroll. Um, and again, turning on payroll, this is where you go to get set up and work with um, into it to make that happen. Thankfully, QBO also does a fantastic job of handling sales tax for us because that is becoming much more of an issue for a lot of clients. You simply go over here and set up sales tax. Um, you do need to assess their sales tax requirements. It is not going to do that for you. You need to understand that and walk through that. And then you would simply set it up entering in the basic information that you need as far as setting that up, including identifying the products and services that are taxable or not, as well as um, identifying the customers that are taxable or not. So all of that comes into play. So we're running to the very end of our time and I wanted to make sure and talk about best practices for training and supporting your client. And this is my favorite part and I killed myself not getting to be able to do this more. There are materials available for you guys for free. I don't know if you know that word. That means there's no charge um, inside the ProAdvisor benefits area. So when you logged into QBOA, on the left side, there's a tab that says ProAdvisor and then benefits. There are free materials that you guys can use to train your clients. Take advantage of that. Demonstrate those workflows that you want them to complete. If you want the client to be giving you receipts, you have to teach them how. They don't get it. You've gotta walk them through that. Demonstrate the workflows. I personally, I mentioned it before, there's an app called Loom, L-O-O-M. It's free. It allows me to record a quick video. By the way, it doesn't have to include my face. It can just be my voice and my screen. And I tell them how to do things in QBO and I send them a link in an email. It is, my clients ask me for them. My team asks me for them so that I can teach them how to do things. So demonstrate the workflow. Use an app. Um, there is an app for QuickBooks Online that allows them to run QuickBooks Online. It doesn't make it an offline version, but it is an app that sits and has kind of this like special browser that has menus in it, unlike a browser does. And it makes them feel a little bit more like what desktop used to be. So that's that can be helpful for those transitioning from desktop to QBO. And then also be available for them. Um, remember, this is not your client's first love, it's yours. Um, doing accounting and bookkeeping, I have some of the smartest clients on the planet working with me and they can't figure out QBO to save their life. But then again, I'm not a great marketer or salesperson and they are. So we each have our different strengths. Be here to answer those questions and help them know what they should be doing and what you should be doing and be really clear about that so that you guys know uh, what each other's gonna do and what to expect on that. For the training for your clients, again, I mentioned this Pro Advisor benefits and then go to the training for your clients and you'll see that there. And this is the information about the app that you guys even can use yourself. And you can see here um, in the background on this image that there's a menu and some clients really like that. 
So that might be helpful for you. Again, it's still QBO, but it's just kind of a proprietary browser instead of using Chrome. Last polling question. Would you recommend this course to a client or, or to a colleague, rather, not a client. This is not meant for users. It's meant for accountants. And so just want to ask this last polling question. This is a lot of content. It has been recorded. They will give you a link for this after the session is over. Um, and you also can feel free to reach out to me. Again, for those of you that have asked, my name is Carla Caldwell. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, my website is Caldwell CT and would love to connect with you if you have additional questions or uh, if there's something I can do to help you grow your practice. Would love to do that. I'm going to go ahead and close down the poll in three, two, and one. And it looks like you guys enjoyed the webinar today. I really appreciate your time today and thank you so much. Check out the additional QuickBooks training events that are taught by your colleagues. Um, and see what else you can do to grow your practice with QBO. Thank you all so much for being here today. Have a great day.